diagnosing gonorrhea, we are concerned not only with the clinical and epidemiologic evidence, but laboratory evidence as well. All physicians, however, may not be equipped for laboratory diagnosis. In such circumstances, it is wise to act on a provisional diagnosis based on history and symptoms while waiting for laboratory confirmation. True diagnosis rests on finding the gonococcus by study of cultures and smears, or to use the word that is gaining preference, spreads. Since facilities for culture study are not available to all physicians, many must depend upon the spread alone. In any case, our concern is to secure material for laboratory study. The first discharge of acute gonorrhea makes this a simple routine matter both in the male and in the female. However, a thick spread makes study difficult, so special care should be taken to make the spread for gram staining thin and uniform. This is best accomplished by rolling the material in the manner shown here. The story is quite different in chronic gonorrhea in both sexes when the profuse discharge is not present. Then it is often extremely difficult to secure material for study. Yet here, careful diagnosis is most important. Chronic gonorrhea is a focus of infection and a constant source of new cases of gonorrhea. As diagnosticians, we must be familiar with those structures where the gonococcus may be found and with the techniques for stripping them. In the male, these structures that harbor the gonococcus are the urethra, the prostate, corpus glands, and the seminal vesicles. Stripping these structures will yield material for study. Of course, it is realized that procedures for stripping these structures are dangerous in the presence of acute gonorrhea and that they belong only to the chronic stage of the disease and among the tests for cure. Stripping the urethra is a simple and familiar procedure. The prostate, however, being highly susceptible to trauma, requires gentle and correct massage. The safest and least painful method is to pass the finger well up over the lateral lobe, bringing it down in a direction parallel to the midline. After both lobes are thus emptied, the finger is passed well up beyond the median sulcus of the prostate and brought several times from there to the anterior extremity of the gland. In this form of massage, the dangers of complications are reduced. The patient's comfort is perhaps the best guide as to the degree of pressure to be used. Wisdom will always err on the side of gentleness. Copper's glands through manipulation may also yield material for study. To find the gland, the tip of the finger is drawn down over the arch of the pubic bone about one half inch to the side of the midline. As it drops from the edge of the bone, it will, particularly in thin patients, fall into a triangular depression. The gland is easily felt by rolling the intervening tissues between the finger and the thumb. Gently rolling the tissue will express secreta lurking in the gland. The seminal vesicles, when stripped, also provide material for study. However, since the prostatic secretion always contains pus when the seminal vesicles are infected, it is rarely necessary to strip them. Stripping is resorted to when vesiculitis is suspected, but the physician should wait until the acute stage of the disease has passed and the chronic stage has been reached. Only then can digital expression of the vesicles be done safely. To strip the vesicles, extend the finger beyond the prostate and to the side of the midline and bring it downward and toward the midline, as shown here.
With the use of these techniques, material for spreads and cultures may be obtained from the urethra, the prostate, corpus glands, and the seminal vesicles. Secretions obtained by stripping any of these glands are collected in sterile broth for cultural studies and stained for microscopic examination. Of course, preparation of the material for laboratory study presents no problem when the specimen is ample. However, stripping the urethra, the prostate, and corpus glands may at times yield only a scanty discharge. And in such cases, the following method may be used to prepare material for study. After stripping the various structures, secure the first half ounce of urine voided. Then, centrifuge the urine and invert the tube so that the urine flows out, leaving the sediment in the tip of the tube. Then place a very small amount of normal salt solution in the tube and shake well so that the sediment is suspended in it. Then centrifuge again. Invert the tube and obtain sediment from its tip for examination. This material is subjected to spread examination and where available culture studies. So much for the male. Now to secure material for study in chronic gonorrhea in the female. Material may be obtained from the urethra, from the endocervical glands, and from skeins, and Bartholin's glands. To secure material for study from the urethra, the urethral meatus is wiped with cotton to remove vulva secretions. The glove finger is then inserted into the vagina and the urethra is stripped from above downward, the external meatus being pressed rather firmly against the pubic bone. A small cotton-wrapped applicator is inserted about half an inch into the urethra. The applicator should secure enough material for stain and culture. Secreta from Skein's glands is expressed by the procedure just described. No additional massage or manipulation is necessary. In obtaining secreta from Bartholin's glands, first wipe the area of the duct with cotton. Then 
Insert the index finger a short way into the vagina and place the thumb on the outer side of the labia majora. The intervening tissue is then gently squeezed. When secretion is obtained in this way, it is usually too scanty to be secured on an applicator. The flat end of a toothpick or a platinum loop is better suited for this purpose. In obtaining material from the cervix, it is well to remember that in the chronic stage of the disease, the gonococci are deep in the endocervical glands and usually not in the plug of mucus filling the canal. Thus, it is best to cleanse this canal with cotton held in a sponge forceps. Then make firm pressure on the cervix with blades of a bivalve speculum and obtain the material thus expressed for study. If spreads of these secretions are thin and uniform, examination will be facilitated. If we rely on the techniques described, we will find that material for test and study is always available. All of these materials from the male and the female can of course be used both for cultures and spreads. Mastery of these techniques will help provide laboratory evidence for diagnosis and what is equally important laboratory confirmation of cure. But as the laboratory checks the clinical symptoms and general treatment, so in the case of chronic gonorrhea in the female, the clinical symptoms and case history must be used as a check on the laboratory. This is necessary because in chronic gonorrhea in women, the gonococcus will sometimes escape detection by both the gram stain and the culture. Consequently, when the history is suspicious and symptoms persist, the laboratory must be challenged, perhaps repudiated. In the case of the female with chronic gonorrhea, we must be guided by epidemiologic and clinical evidence, as well as by laboratory evidence. If symptoms and history point to the gonococcus, treatment is definitely in order. To withhold treatment is to risk new infections and grave complications to the patient. In any case, the procedure of treating on suspicion cannot be challenged. We all know patients who come for examination never return. We know that often we have a positive diagnosis from the laboratory, but no patient. To treat on suspicion, to warn at once that an infectious disease may be present, and to urge the patient to act accordingly, is to move toward gonorrhea control. Certainly, where infectious diseases are concerned, every physician feels that his responsibility extends beyond his patient. It extends to the people the patient may infect. Since diagnosis is an integral part of the patient's first visit, and this first encounter with the physician has a profound influence on the patient's later behavior, it may be in order to discuss further at this point the patient and his doctor. Effective venereal disease control and good case holding rest on the doctor-patient relationship and require that the patient be considered as a total medical problem. The patient must be given an understanding of the nature of his problem and he must be given an objective which will impel him to continue treatment. The patient may have syphilis. There may be other complications. Certainly in a patient with gonorrheal infection, syphilis must be considered. Ideally, 
The history of gonorrhea case follows these general lines. The patient usually comes to the doctor's office three to six days after exposure, when the symptoms appear. Following the examination, the doctor takes material for a spread. He also takes a blood test for syphilis as part of the physical examination. It is too early to check for a syphilitic infection which may have been contracted when gonorrhea was contracted. But the doctor explains that the danger of such an infection exists. If possible, the doctor then gets the name of the contact and speaks of bringing her under treatment. He also explains the nature of the disease to the patient in language that the patient can understand. The patient returns in three days for a second examination and to learn the laboratory findings. Let us assume that the findings of the test for syphilis are negative. The smear, however, is positive. Since treatment began with the first visit, the doctor now simply checks the progress of the disease. Seven days later, the symptoms of most patients will have vanished. But now enough time may have elapsed for penile lesions to appear if the patient also contracted syphilis. The doctor looks for lesions, and if he finds them, does a dark field test at once. Let us assume that no lesions are found at this time. The patient returns again in seven days for two reasons. So that the doctor can check the gonorrhea cure and look for penile lesions again. We assume that again, no lesions are found. The patient returns and is re-examined for infectious lesions at weekly intervals for three weeks. Thereafter, every two weeks for another six weeks. A second blood test is part of the final examination. We have thus completed a three-month period of observation. The course of action described here has given the patient the fullest possible protection. His gonorrhea cure has been determined. The physician has also determined whether or not there was a syphilitic infection. The results are good case holding and effective venereal disease control. These are objectives that must be attained. We know only too well that they will never come to us from the laboratory, but only from an appreciation of human relationships. When we speak of chemotherapy, we speak of the weapon with which a change in history has been wrought. We speak of a swift, sure, and inexpensive cure for gonorrhea. Chemotherapy in gonorrhea has made difficult and painful local treatment unnecessary, except in the small number of patients who do not respond to such medication. It is a great boon to the private physician, to clinics carrying heavy caseloads, often with extremely limited personnel. And of course, it is a great boon to the patient. In discussing this new treatment, it may be well to recall an error of the past in order to dispose of it permanently for the future. Sulfonilamide was the first sulfur drug used in the treatment of gonorrhea. Although toxic reactions were frequent and sometimes grave, it continued in use for a time because a better substitute was not yet found. Because to tens of thousands infected with gonorrhea, it offered the promise of a swift cure, a swift return to the jobs from which the disease had taken them. This early sulfonamide compound held out a hope to gonorrhea sufferers. But sulfonilamide produced toxic reactions in many patients and created numerous asymptomatic carriers. Laboratories focused their attention on finding a safer and more effective chemotherapeutic agent. New sulfur drugs were produced rapidly drugs superior to sulfonilamide. As these more effective drugs appeared, leading clinicians and the United States Public Health Service abandoned sulfonilamide. But sulfonilamide had been widely publicized, and so it gave way but slowly to the more effective, safer drugs. Doctors continued to prescribe it. Patients continued to ask for it. But there is no place for sulfonilamide in the treatment of gonorrhea. Today, the drug of choice 
is sulfathiazole. But research and experience indicates that it may be entirely supplanted by penicillin. The toxicity of penicillin is negligible. The toxicity of sulfathiazole is low and the reactions are mild. Rarely does a patient find it impossible to consume enough of the drug to bring about a cure. Even when low blood concentrations are maintained, a relatively high cure rate is achieved. Of course, there are a few people who cannot tolerate any of the sulfur drugs in any concentration, and so all patients must be watched. This is no drug to be sold over a counter without a prescription. 20 grams is a recommended dosage for a single course of treatment. Four grams a day for five days. However, if this first course of sulfathiazole fails to bring about a cure, medication should be discontinued for seven to ten days. And then a second course of treatment given. A number of patients will not be cured. Penicillin should be considered. Penicillin therapy of gonorrhea may mark or delay symptoms of syphilis. Patient observation should be continued over three months. A special precaution against transmitting a possible chronic infection, the physician should insist that a condom be used at every sexual contact for three months after disappearance of symptoms. With the aid of these drugs, we can, in a short time, make gonorrhea a comparatively rare disease. Prophylaxis is the other great ally of gonorrhea control. Civilian and military health authorities now recognize its value and urge its widespread use. To make descriptions of approved techniques available to physicians, these publications have been prepared and are furnished on request. The greatest safety in preventive measures other than continence belongs to the condom. But improper use of the condom destroys its value. Instruction of the patient is part of the physician's role in implementing prophylaxis. Common habits, such as using a condom only at the end of intercourse, should be condemned. The patient should also be warned to put on the condom before his hand comes into contact with the woman's genitalia, lest he carry the infection to his own organs before intercourse has begun. These and other points need to be impressed on the patient. The pamphlet shown is intended for lay education and can also be secured from the United States Public Health Service. The prophylactic packet is sometimes effective, but here again, the patient needs instruction as to its proper use. Chemical prophylaxis is most effective when administered under medical supervision. When administered soon after exposure, it is at least 90% effective. Prophylactic measures are not as easily applied in women, nor are they considered to be as efficacious. There is no doubt that widespread use of prophylaxis will aid materially in controlling gonorrhea. Education of the public so that people will not go to the quack, but to the licensed physician. Early diagnosis by the physician. Correct use of prophylaxis. Sulfathiazole, penicillin, these things are weapons in the hands of the medical profession. And most important in gonorrhea therapy, let us remember this. The laboratory is not infallible. Clinical and epidemiologic findings are ample grounds for treatment. If we use them as a basis for treatment, we will eradicate many infections that in the past filtered through the diagnostic net. Certainly sulfathiazole and penicillin are a promise and a challenge to the medical profession. An opportunity to wipe out one of our oldest diseases and an opportunity to save millions of man days lost to industry and the armed forces. To prevent a great loss to the nation's health and strength.
Thank you.